wonderful. All right, lots of good questions. I finished going through the rest of the quizzes from a few weeks ago. Um, apologies about the quiz over the weekend. I'm sure you all hated the fact that you didn't have a quiz. Um, I'd like to say it was intentional, but I just forgot to, to set up the quiz at the end of last week. Um, although, if I had realized that I was so far behind on grading, then uh, um, I would have canceled the quiz anyway, because I don't like to give you new quizzes when I have haven't given you feedback on the quiz from the week ago. I try to keep up. I'm really bad at keeping up on grading labs and homework assignments, but I at least try to keep up on grading quizzes. And so I try not to give you more quizzes if I haven't given you feedback yet. Um, so, but I think I'm most of the way down grading that quiz um, and at least have addressed all the questions at this point. Um, so random questions. Somebody asked how, how the mole constant was originally found, or not in relation to the mole constant, how was it Faraday originally found, the charge on the mole of electrons? The charge on an electron, um, actually, the a Coulomb was already defined when they, um, when they figured out, when they discovered electrons, when Thomson discovered electrons. And so determining the charge on an individual electron um, was actually done by figuring out um, there was an experiment called the Millikan oil drop, which basically basically you had like a little perfume bottle with a with a spray nozzle and one of those you know like squeeze bulbs off the end of it that would spray little droplets. They took this an oil. That they could put, and they use a really, really fine. They call this an atomizer. And basically, this atomizer sprayed in between two charged plates. No, sorry, the charge was down here. Um, down here, there was a, like a little pinhole. So you had these really, really tiny droplets. They weren't actually down to the atomic level, even though they called it an atomizer. Um, it was just really, really tiny droplets, and then this tiny pinhole meant that you had these really tiny little droplets that would drop through in a straight line. And then these two plates were charged. Um, and the atomization process, they figured out actually could um, create these charged particles. So they would be slight, generate a slight amount of static electricity by stripping electrons off of the oil droplets. And so you had these charged particles falling, and if this was, if these particles were all negatively charged, or sorry, positively charged, and this bottom plate was negatively charged, the positive charge basically would be, no, I had to write the first time, this one's positive too. They would repel that, those little droplets, and they could adjust this voltage so that it was, it, um, you could get these little droplets to hover to levitate, not fall or drop. And so by measuring what the voltage was on these two plates and figuring out the radius of the droplets and the, therefore the mass of the droplets, they could work backward to figure out, okay, the force of gravity on this tiny droplet is this. That means it must be equal to the force of, of repulsion from these two, from this bottom plate. And then they say, okay, if the force of repulsion has to be this, they basically realized that they only could have integer values of a certain charge. And that charge is at 1.6 times 10 to the minus 24 coulombs. And that's how they define Faraday's constant. The charge on in coulombs on a mole of electrons was based on this Millikan oil droplet. And then they, in chemists, then decide, okay, well, if that's the smallest unit of charge you can have, let's just do everything in relation to a charge on an electron instead of using Coulombs at all. And that's why we just only deal in an integer charges. We don't actually put a number in terms of Coulombs on the charge of an electron because it doesn't really matter to chemistry. In physics and, and electrical engineering, stuff like that, it does. Total number of Coulombs. We just don't think about it that way. It's not as relevant. When I say we, I'm including everybody in here. Y'all are honorary chemists while you're here. Um, so you are a chemist, um, and therefore you don't care about Coulombs either. For now. 
Um, so yes, is water wet? And that just depends entirely on your definitions. Um, in chemistry, especially organic chemistry, um, we frequently define if something is wet, we would say that it's the opposite of dry. And you can have dry liquids in organic chemistry. A dry liquid is just a liquid that you removed all the water from. So the definition of wet means it has water in it. So by that definition, yeah, water is wet. By other engineering or physics definitions, you could make the argument that water is not wet if it doesn't have certain properties. Um, but a lot of times that's actually how dry cleaning works. Dry cleaning uses liquids that don't have any water in them, that they've removed all the water from the dry cleaning fluid. So they're still using liquids to wash stuff, just not water-based liquids, water-based solutions. Um, and so that, by, by the organic chemist definition, makes it a dry fluid. Um, how do, how does, do quartz watches work? Um, quartz is what's called a piezoelectric material. which means when you apply a voltage to it, it vibrates. And it does so because applying the voltage actually changes those energy levels such that you get a different average um, bond length between the different atoms in it. And then, but then they'll kind of like, they'll stretch and then they snap back to where they were. And so you get this sort of really consistent periodic vibration. And then we use that, I think it's one times 10 to the minus six Hertz or something like that for quartz, if you apply you know, a standard watch battery, so you apply a small amount of voltage and that causes a mechanical vibration, which is what then you, you hook that up to some gears and some really fine machinery and you get a mechanical um, watch. Um, interestingly enough, piezo piezoelectrics um, are just like semiconductors in that they can work both directions. Instead of applying a voltage, if you, if you apply a compression to a piezoelectric material, you generate a voltage. Um, and so that's actually how acoustic guitar pickups work. Acoustic guitar pickups basically just have a piezoelectric material that sits underneath the bridge of the guitar where the strings rest. And when, that, when the bridge of the guitar vibrates, it compresses and causes that vibration to transfer to the, to the um, piezoelectric material, which generates a voltage which can then be picked up by a transformer, by an amplifier, amplified and turned into an electrical signal. Um, so it's actually, it's just like how semiconductors can be either a photovoltaic material, like a solar cell, or the, if, you, if you wire them up in the opposite way, they could be an LED. Piezoelectric materials can either generate a voltage based on a vibration, or they can generate a vibration based on a voltage. Turns out that engineers are rather clever sometimes. Um, have we talked about OCHEM in this class yet? Anybody? Have we asked? This is a really common question from my um, from my high school students. They want to know what OCHEM is all about, why it has a reputation it does. Um, OCHEM is really not, it's really using some of the concepts we deal with in organic chemistry, like equilibrium, sorry, in general chemistry, equilibrium and rates especially. Um, and and just the idea of, of stoichiometry um, and polar molecules get applied to everything. We apply those four concepts, basically explain almost all of organic chemistry. I guess, and if you're talking about polar molecules, that also means orbitals and things like paired electrons and Lewis dot structures, all that stuff. Um, it's basically being applied to a narrow subset of molecules that are really important to humanity and to life on um, Earth, because we are all carbon made of a bunch of carbon based uh, molecules. Um, so it's not that different. It has a reputation of being very different than general chemistry because instead of being this really broad overview where we hit like one chapter every, you know, a week basically, it feels like we're going really fast and sometimes it doesn't feel like the chapters necessarily connect with each other. It's because if every single chapter in this class is its own upper division course, semester long course, and we're covering them in two weeks. So we're trying to give everybody a really broad overview of everything in chemistry so that whichever way you go into, whichever field you go into in STEM, you have at least seen most of the concepts that your discipline is gonna spend a lot of time 
Um, but the result of that is it's really fast, really disjointed, really map heavy um, in terms of getting basic skills. OCAM just has almost zero map. Um, like molecular weights and percent yields is about the only map that you do in organic chemistry, um, which means that people that do well in, o in gen chem because they're good at math don't like OCAM because it just feels like there's no math to it. And people that get through gen chem because they're really good at memorizing per procedures and things like that don't do really well in gen chem or in OCAM either because you can't memorize your way through it. You have to understand some basic concepts really well and be able to apply them to a wide range of things. And so, it, and since that encompasses most engineers fall into the first group of people, they're good at math and they don't like OCHEM because there's not enough math. And most pre-meds don't like it because pre-meds, I'm going to make a generalization here, please nobody be offended. Pre-meds tend to be really good at memorizing and kind of sort of brute force their way through a class. I'm just going to memorize my way out of this. I'm going to memorize everything. Um, and then you don't have to spend as much time understanding these weird concepts. If you can just memorize stuff, and that doesn't work in OCHEM either. So the two main groups that aren't chemists that have to take OCHEM both hate it for different reasons, typically. Um, that said, it's my favorite type of chemistry. I love teaching it. It's my, what my grad school research was in. I get OCHEM. I think my students get OCHEM pretty well. And so some people wind up really liking OCHEM that don't expect it because it gets a bad rap. It has a bad reputation because people don't know what to do with it going into it. Sydney, did you have a question? Yeah. Do you teach the same chemistry to your high school students as us? Like the same? I teach Chem 100 to the high school students right now. So, um, which is basically we touch on equilibrium we might do a little bit of rates but it's mainly just stoichiometry gas laws um phase change stuff like that it's basically honors high school chemistry um but a lot of them think they're going to be pre-meds not that they're not going to be pre-meds but but when you're a high schooler and you're told you're good at science that's what your parents always tell you to do at least mine did oh if you're good at science you should be a doctor um false because doctors aren't scientists um but a lot of them think they're going to be pre-meds for that reason and they're still figuring out what they want so they all have this like you know complex about organic chemistry already at 17 like oh okay, that's going to be so hard um which is weird to me because i never even heard of organic chemistry before i took ap chem yeah. <laughs> um that sounds fun in high school <laughs> if you like if you like the concepts of the stuff we talk about, if you like the way that we do quantum-based stuff, talking about orbitals and more conceptual-based and explaining things in general terms, then you'll like OCHEM because it's a lot of that. Explain how this happens talking in terms of talking about electrons and orbitals. It's not a lot of, here's a word problem, can you know use conversions to figure stuff out or use ice tables. We don't do, I think we might use an ice table once. Um, in a, in a lab, but in general, it's a, it's just very different. Uh, last of the random quiz questions: What do we do if our if our research project fails? Um, so a negative result is still a result. It doesn't they don't get published very often, but I think that's actually a fundamental flaw with the way that um, science publishing works. Is that that journals, high impact journals, don't want to publish negative results because it doesn't drive clicks. Even before there were clicks to drive, it was the same general idea. Like, well, nobody's going to pick up our our magazine to read our journal to read this if it's all just filled with a bunch of things that didn't work. Um, so as a result, nobody talks about things that didn't work in their research, and that leads to a lot of duplicated effort, because if I'm working on my research over here and it's kind of related to Zane's research, we both tried the same to get the same experiment to work. I tried it five years ago. I know it doesn't work, and I know all the things I tried and why it doesn't work. If I don't tell Zane about it, he's going to replicate all of that effort and waste his time trying to do something that I already know can't be done, um, or at least like you know, redo the same exact experiments. So there is value in negative results. If, and ideally, we want to try and workshop. That doesn't mean you try it once and give up and say it didn't work, and that's our project. But it does mean that, okay, if we tried it five different ways and we kept track of the five different ways, 
and we think we can explain why the five different ways didn't work, then that can be your project to just present, here's all the stuff we tried and here's our best guess for why. Um, ideally though, we would be able to tweak the procedure to make it work and then say, well, we tried it this way, it didn't work, here's what we did to fix it, is the best possible outcome for something like that. But if we run out of time, we run out of time. Um, more relevant stuff about rates. So from the quiz last week, um, does this reaction give us information about what happens first? No, the rate law tells us, can tell us some parts of, of the mechanism, but in terms of like, what is, are we actually like making the N2O first and then making a water molecule? Is it happening simultaneously? We can't really tell that just from this in the rate law. We have to kind of get more creative. And that's the part that, of OCHEM that is really scary um, and that people struggle with is actually, we spend a ton of time on mechanisms. Here's a reaction we know happens. Here's the information we have, like the rate law. We talk a lot about this rate is, or this reaction's first order in this, in this reactant. What does that tell us about the mechanism? How can we write a mechanism that's consistent with that? Um, but a lot of it is kind of creative in terms of like, well, like could go this way, or maybe we change the order of these steps in and does that match the rate law better? Um, but it doesn't tell you anything necessarily right off the bat. Um, and I should have grouped these a little bit better by a topic. Um, somebody asked about like, well, why don't, why can't we just use the coefficients from the rate law and now from the balanced reaction and throw them in the rate law? Why do we need the method of initial rates? Same reason, because the coefficients don't tell the whole story. The coefficients don't tell us about what order things happen in or what actually has to bump into what in the slowest step. In equilibrium, it works out because everything winds up canceling out because you have, even if you have a bunch of small steps, you can add them up to get the same net change to get just products and reactants. So in equilibrium, we could just take the coefficient and put it as the exponent. That's not the case with rates because mechanisms are more complicated than thermodynamics. Thermodynamics being equilibrium. Um, and same with this question. So why do we care about the overall reaction rate or um, overall reaction uh, order? Because it tells us about that mechanism. It allows us to kind of get creative and say, okay, well, here's a possibility. Here's a mechanism that fits the rate law because this would be our slow step. In our slow step means that working backwards, we can figure out that that the rate law would be this. So you can never really prove a mechanism is accurate or prove that a mechanism is true. All we can do is say, okay, well, these series of steps add up to the same, the right net reaction and match the rate law the way we would expect it to work. And so the overall reaction um, order winds up being used that way, but it's not as commonly used as being, yeah, it doesn't make sense to say it's third order overall, it makes more sense usually to say it's first order in hydrogen, second order in nitrogen monoxide, because that has much more information in that statement, right? Um, last but not least, what is what is the um, law called? Is it, it's not just the law of logs um, for the uh, how do you do log base anything else? Um, if you're trying to put the to use logs in your calculator, what is that that rule called that lets you do the division by other log powers? Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't know what it's called. I know how to do it mathematically. Run the hooks. What is it? Bruce always calls it running the hooks. Running the hook. You would. Um, if we want to say like log base four of 16, I'm picking easy numbers because we know log base four of 16 What's the exponent that you would put on four to give you 16? Four squared is 16, right? So we know that log base four of 16 is two. It's four to the two, or four to the second power gives you 16. If I wanted to plug this into the calculator, 
your calculator doesn't have a log base four button. Well, actually, Wolfram Alpha does. If you have a log base four calculator, it depends on the calculator. It depends on the calculator. It depends on the It wasn't even on a J word, no? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. All you have to do is say, you just type log and then you type the base, log four of two of 16. And that should give us two as our answer. And I like Wolfram Alpha because it tells us the way it interpreted it. That's what we wanted it to be, right? Log base four of 16, result two. The other way that you can do it is there's a property of logs that lets you say, okay, if it's log base four of 16 is the same as, is equal to log base 10 of 16 divided by log base 10 of four. Oh. Uh, as long as you can do log base 10, you can do log base any, and this works for anything. You can use natural log here. Log base, as long as you have the same log base on top and bottom, this works. Um, so as long as you can get to log base 10, you can do log base anything. Um, that said, my first thought when I when I wanted to type this in to check if I was understanding it, if I was doing it right, I went to over an alpha because I knew I could type log base four and just type it in directly. This Change of base. Change of base. Thank you. You get really good at it. I suppose that makes you the ace of base. Yeah. <laughs> That's rough. That was my wife's first CD she ever bought with her own money. Yeah. Um, all right. Last few relevant questions, and then we'll get to nuclear stuff again. Would slowing the reaction rate be able to reduce the amount of reaction that is used up during a reaction? Yes, but you'll also get less product. So you, can, you can't really make it more efficient necessarily by controlling the reaction rate, but you can make it so that like, okay, I'm trying to use this really expensive reactant and I don't want to, I don't want to use too much of it. By controlling the reaction rate, you can make sure you only use as much as needed, potentially. Um, but it, it comes with the cost that you don't make as much product either. So really, a lot of times, we'll talk a little bit about this. We'll talk about power generation later today. We'll talk about nuclear power plants if we get, if we get there. Um, and we'll be able to talk about how in that, In your delta G equation, any reaction that's spontaneous, delta G has to be negative, right? The problem is you don't get to use all the energy that's generated from delta G. You can't take delta G and take all of those kilojoules per mole and actually get useful energy out of it. You always have to pay what's called the heat tax. And the heat tax is basically the entropy term. Your entropy term is always going to be wasted energy. Energy that can't be used in any other way, in any useful way. So you're always going to have some amount of inefficiency built into any process. Um, and that's partly just based on the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics limits how efficient you can actually make anything. You can't make a perfectly efficient internal combustion engine. You can't make a perfectly efficient battery because everything has energy lost as heat. Um, then last but not least, why do the units often break down to equilibrium and then we just wind up ignoring them? It's because we're equilibrium and kinetics in general both have this issue where you're not actually basing it on we treat it like concentration or pressures is the is the really relevant variable. It's actually another variable that we don't, as a collectively as a group in this room, have the tools yet to even define called chemical potential. 
which is basically the second derivative of the Gibbs free energy. Um, and the second derivative of the Gibbs free energy equation, so it would be delta delta G. Um, you take the derivative of the delta G equation um, with a couple of problems, uh, so you have to do partial differentials for it to work. We wind up seeing that it's based on the total number of molecules that are free to react, which kind of makes sense. We use concentration or pressure as a stand in because we understand those units. You don't have the tools to understand chemical potential units yet or how to use them. Um, but, and they actually kind of make, make the units on equilibrium constants make more sense if you do them in chemical potential units instead of in concentration units. But that's a key chem issue. That's a third, third or fourth year chemistry class um, where you actually get into that. And I re still remember when I was in grad school, the first time chemical potential was brought up, um, the entire class just groaned um, because it's one of those topics that's really tricky mathematically. It's really weird conceptually. And so everybody studied it well enough to pass the test and then hopefully they never had to look at it again. Um, it's one of those type of topics. So we're just skipping over that at this point. But just know that the, the units don't break down so much as the assumption that we, the assumptions we're making um, break down if you try to include the units. Right. They work as long as you ignore the units. Excuse me. All right. So let's... Let's do some practice. Um, so a reminder where we were with nuclear reactions. We hadn't done anything with, with radiometric dating or any calculations really with it, right? So let's just review some of the, um, some of the processes. The, this is one of the big skills. Is if I tell you, if I give you something like this, can you write out the complete reaction? Not yet, you can. Um, does anybody remember what our biggest types of, of um, radioactivity were? Or categories of vision? So an alpha particle was, was a helium nucleus, right? A beta particle was an electron. So I had no mass, but a minus one charge. Uh, a positron still had no mass, but with a plus one charge. And then an electron capture is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of emitting a beta particle from the nucleus, the right nucleus will basically just snatch up one of those 1s electrons and stuff it into the nucleus and convert a proton to a neutron when it does it. We call that electron capture. So for this problem, it says beta particle. It can emit a beta particle or it can capture an electron. And that's going to give us a different product depending on what happens. In terms of, if we use the dice analogy, something like this where there's two possible products from a nuclear reaction would be like um, if you rolled your dice and if you got a six, you put it into one pile. And if you got a five, you put it into a different pile. And if you got one through four, it stayed in your jar and you shook it up again. Right. So there's a different, there's a different probability for either of these two processes, and they give you two different products in a statistical ratio based on those probabilities, based on those K values. You're gonna have different rate constants for these two reactions, but they're sort of competing with each other. So let's do let's do the election electron capture first, because that one's kind of a little, maybe a little easier to see what's going on. So if we have potassium 40, and again, we're not worried about the charges on these at this point. We're just counting um, the protons and neutrons. We're counting the nucleons up. So if we took the potassium and we threw an extra electron at it and it stuck into the nucleus, that electron is not going to change the overall mass, right? So whatever we get as a product is still going to have a mass number of 40. 
Well, we're changing the number of protons. Is the number of protons going to go up or down? Down. Down. We're taking something negative and we're stuffing it into the nucleus. So we're canceling out one of the protons. You can think of it that way. Again, it's not exactly what's happening, but it's a good way to think about it. You take a proton and you shove an electron onto it, you get a neutron. So we take one of these 19 protons, turn it into a neutron. So we still have a mass of 40, but now we only have 18 protons, which makes it, consult your periodic table, but I believe that's argon. Okay, so that's kind of the, the approach for these problems is, okay, I know what I'm starting with, and I know what the, what the other particle is. I have to tell you, it's a beta particle, or it's an alpha particle, or it's electron capture. I'm not expecting you to just know this information off the top of your head. I, on the test, I am going to expect that you know what a beta particle is and that you can complete this process. So it's going to take some practice, but mainly just vocab. So if it's going to emit it's going to emit a beta particle instead of absorbing an electron, it's, it's giving off an electron. So that's the exact opposite. This one was an extra electron stuck to a proton and turned it into a neutron. A beta particle emission is the opposite. A neutron gets rid of an electron and turns to a proton. So the overall charges still have to add up. So if we lost the negative charge from that nucleus, what do we have an extra of? What type of charge? An extra proton. So it's still mass of 40. We took one of the, whatever that is, 21 neutrons and turned it into a proton, which then gives us calcium, I think, right? And that's going to have its own rate constant. Both of these rate constants are going to be different. One of them is going to be a faster, more likely process than another than the other. All right. So, questions on those four major categories of vision. Mm -hmm. Alpha, alpha particles, beta particles, positrons, which is the opposite of a beta particle, and electron capture. The nice thing about these two is they have the same net result. Because either ca capturing an electron is the exact same thing as has the same net result as throwing an extra positron away. Either way, you're losing a positive charge in your nucleus, but the mass is staying the same. Positrons just look weird because we're not used to thinking about antimatter because it's weird. All right, questions so far. Jackson? So is like the, the 19 to 20 that representing the protons? Yes, so the bottom left to the top left of the of the atomic symbol is your total mass number, right? We don't usually write this number because if you know what the element is, it doesn't really make a whole, it's redundant. But in the case of, it's really helpful in writing these reactions out because it allows you to, to then, okay, it's 18 and then go look it up. It kind of is a way of showing your work while you're figuring out how to do this. Um, so yeah, so 19, 18, and 20 are representing protons. And the mass number is 40 in all of these cases. All right, any other questions on this one? 
seems simple as not enough as long as I'm the one up here doing it, right? It's one of those where it's going to take some practice. Um, and I would just go, you know, do the practice test and practice going through. Like, just it doesn't matter if it's a process that would happen in real life or not. You don't need to go out and look up what elements go through alpha particles. Just say, okay, I'm going to pick this element and isotope at random and say it goes through an alpha particle today. What does that give me as my product? Do you you can just make it up. Do you mind doing the alpha one? Sure. So let me, I'm going to clear this. So an alpha particle, or if we're still talking about potassium 40, an alpha particle is just a helium nucleus, but we usually write it like this to indicate that it's not just helium, that it came from the nucleus here. So if we just broke off a helium nucleus from potassium 40, potassium 40 lost four mass number. So it's whatever it is now, it's 36, it's got a mass of 36. And we lost two protons. So that means it's a 17 now. So an element 17, fluorine. Make me go backwards on the periodic table across a row is like having to do borrowing in my head. They should have you do that when the path of sobriety comes. What? The path of sobriety comes. I heard, I've heard some, I have no idea if this is true or not, but I've heard that police officers don't actually expect you to get all the way through the alphabet no, backwards. No. Um, it's just about making you think like, stop it. and think about it. And then they just look at you while you're thinking and see how far you get. So they don't actually, it's just another case of, um, they can make whatever they want of that. Um, so in other words, don't piss off a cop because they'll arrest you for something, whether it's reasonable or not. Or just be okay spending the night in jail. Yeah. All right. So why is it that some particles, some nuclei go through different types? Why do we have all of these? And why do some elements go through them and others don't? What turns out that those, those two forces that we don't deal with very much in chemistry. So of our four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetic force, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, classical physics basically just looks at gravity. And when you get into circuits, you're dealing with some electro, electromagnetic force. Chemistry, non-nuclear chemistry, basically only looks at electromagnetic force. In one form or another, everything is about charge and electrons, right? Nuclear chemistry is the other two forces. Is a strong nuclear force and a weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is actually what allows neutrons and protons to stick together. Because if you just think about electromagnetic force, so gravity would say that anything with masses should be drawn together, right? Gravity is that's how gravity works. If it has mass, there's an attractive force, period. Electromagnetic force says, well, if there's opposite charges, they're attracted, but if they're the same charges, they repel, right? Well, protons all have the same charge. And neutrons don't have any charge. So why does a nucleus exist at all? And that's those other two forces. The strong nuclear force is the force that holds nuclei together. Um, and it works best, they interact strong, and really it's strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force together. And the thing is, is that there are certain combinations of protons and neutrons that allow a nucleus to be stable. There's various points where those two forces um, are working really well together. And you wind up with, in physics, because physics can't do anything simply, um, the physicists in the 20th century, basically, they called them like magic numbers, not actually magic, but there are certain combinations of neutrons to protons that result in a really stable nucleus. If you 
don't have one of those magic ratios, you have an unstable nucleus. And the unstable nucleus will usually be trying to get to a more stable nucleus, getting to a better ratio of neutrons to protons. So what does that actually look like? Um, Laura? Just real quick, sorry for the, on the top there, the electron capture. Mm -hmm. Can you say briefly like what, why there, the proton is lost? There, it's not so much that it's lost, it's that it's converted to a neutron. The electron is absorbed into a proton, and then you have the two charges canceling each other out. And so in, in all of these cases, we wind up with that ratio. For whatever reason, this is not a stable ratio, protons to total mass. This is a more stable ratio, and this is a more stable ratio. And so what the two things that can happen is either it can snatch up an electron and turn a proton into a neutron to get to be more stable. But then the, the 40 didn't change. But the 40 didn't change. So our mass number didn't change because we didn't add an extra neutron. We took a proton and we turned it into a neutron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And that's that's kind of the definition of a nuclear reaction is that something weird is happening in the nucleus, something that we've ignored. We kind of haven't dealt with the nuclei changing at any point in this class yet, right? Um, so just from looking at it experimentally, we actually can go through and find all the stable isotopes of all the different elements. So that's what this graph represents. If you look at the at the x-axis, it's number of protons, meaning the atomic number. And the y-axis is the number of neutrons. And so you have you get this sort of ratio. This is the slope of this of the uh, line, where if you have something, if you have a small nucleus, then you want about a one-to-one -one ratio for neutrons to protons, tends to be pretty stable. As you get to larger and larger nuclei, the weak nuclear force starts becoming more and more important. And the weak nuclear force um, is more stable when you get about this 1.25 to 1 ratio. And so what this graph is really showing, all of the yellow are isotopes that can be made, or isotopes that are radioactive, that are unstable nuclei. All of the greenish blue dots in there are stable nuclei meaning that on the time scale of our solar system, they don't go through nuclear reactions naturally. We can force them to go through nuclear reactions sometimes, but usually we do that by, by using a particle accelerator and just throwing an extra neutron in something to turn it from a stable nucleus into an unstable nucleus, and then it tends to split apart. Um, and so this sort of area where you, you see all of these stable nuclei, it's called the Valley of Stability. Um, and depending on which side of the Valley of Stability you're on, will kind of dictate whether it's going to go through an alpha, alpha particle emission or beta particle emission or positron emission. Because you're trying to get to the bottom of the valley. If you're in the yellow, you're up on the hillside on either side of the valley. You're trying to get down to the more stable states. So if you have too many neutrons and not enough protons, what type of uh, nuclear reaction would we expect to see? So alpha particle gets rid of two of each, right? And so that doesn't really change. It changes your ratio, but um, not necessarily in a way that gets you closer. That's more like a lateral move. You move from here to here. You're still up on the hillside. So beta. Beta particle, if you take, if you do beta particle emission. Electron capture. <laughs> that makes that word. Positron. Electron capture makes more neutrons. Positron emission is also going to make more neutrons. So beta particle emission then is going to take a neutron and turn it into a proton. And so in other words, that's making a step that way because you took away a, a neutron, so you went down, and then you went 
you added a, a proton, so you went to the right. So if you're up here on the on the neutron side of the valley, beta particle emissions would make you work better. Um, and we get you closer to the valley of stability. If you're on the, the proton heavy side, we want to get rid of a proton and turn it into a neutron. In which case, electron capture or uh, positron emission is going to get us there. The other interesting thing about this, well, there's, a few, there's lots of interesting things about this, um, if you know where to look, but look what happens when you get to, uh, what is that, about 84? And 100 and 126 neutrons. What happens when you get bigger than that? You reach the end of the valley of stability. <laughs> Basically, when you get to a large enough nucleus, the weak nuclear force is too strong for the strong nuclear force. And it's not strong enough to hold those nuclei together. Now, some of them can have really, really long half-lives. Sometimes these processes are really, really slow. But everything bigger than lead 206 or lead 208 will eventually decay and find itself somewhere in this valley of stability. It might take a whole bunch of steps. You start up here, you can do something like, okay, alpha particle decay, followed by beta particle decay, followed by alpha particle decay, alpha particle decay, uh, positron emission, alpha particle decay, alpha particle decay, you get a whole bunch of steps and you end up getting one of those stable nuclei emissions. Basically, you are limited in the types of steps you can take for the most part, unless we have a true fission reaction where we actually have things busting up into um, much smaller pieces or a lot of smaller pieces. We'll talk about those kind of uh, reactions here. Those are the kind of reactions that you don't want to see happening um, on a regular basis because those are the ones that tend to lead to things like nuclear um, meltdowns or a nuclear bomb. Um, but in general, everything is trying to make its way to this valley of stability. Sounds like a cult. It does. It would be a good cult name, wouldn't it? The valley of stability. Make your way to the valley of stability. <laughs> All right. So here's just a zoomed in version of what I was just showing you. So uranium-238, for instance. Uranium-238 is an unstable. It's bigger than lead. It is lead-206. Lead 206 is the end point of this decay series. And so the uranium 238 starts with a whole bunch of neutrons and protons. It starts with an alpha decay, followed by a beta part, beta decay, then goes back to being uranium. So uranium 238 breaks down in three steps, become uranium 234. And then it keeps going, make thorium, radium, radon, polonium. And then it has a couple of different options you can go to. It's a little bit like the Pachinko machine, right? You have ping ponging back and forth to become more stable. Some of these steps are slow and some of these steps are fast. Um, I believe that in general, the uranium 238 to thorium 234 is the slowest step here. But when we're actually trying to use this for dating, um, minerals, we tend to just look at the ratio of the end product to the initial product, because it doesn't really matter which step is the slow step, right? It matters how much we go or how much of final product we have versus how much do, um, reactive do we have left over. Here's another view of the, this is inverted, so it's not a valley of stability, it's the island of stability in this case, in the sea of instability. <laughs> so here's our same, this is basically zooming in on some really big nuclei. So if you look at these ratios, we're starting at um, a mass of 100 and 170. 
So uranium is relatively stable. All there's, and I say relatively stable. They're not totally stable because obviously uranium is still going to break down eventually. Um, but all of those synthetic elements, all the new ones that we keep making, that are really, really unstable that have half-lives measured in the seconds, like element 118 and things like that. Um, we can see, okay, well, why would we keep making these? Why, why are theoretical physicists, particle physicists spending all their time trying to make these new elements if there's no use to them? Well, it's because the theoretical physics and those and understanding the strong force and weak force in those magic numbers predicts there's actually another group of relatively stable elements and isotopes in about the 120 range, 120 to 125. Actually, this just has it at the proton number of 10. Um, but this, this is an out of date one, but there's actually a more stable elements predicted to exist past element 118, which is going to be really going to mess up our periodic tables because we just finished the seventh row, right? So we're going to have to add a mostly empty eighth row when they start finding those elements. Um, and the interesting thing about those is the elements that are expected to be relatively stable in the 120 to 125 range. Um, have some really interesting properties, but they also require more energy than you could get from a supernova. So, so they actually are not known to be formed by any naturally occurring processes in the universe. So it's not just like there's none on Earth because of the way the, our solar system formed. In theory, there are none in the universe other than what um, intelligent, but, life. intelligent life may have made if it's even possible to make them. We still haven't been able to make them. Theoretically, we should be able to make them, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, so that's why we keep building big, bigger and bigger particle accelerators. There is like a practical use in theory at the end there. And who knows what keeps going, if you keep going past that. Some of those might not be really interesting in terms of being superconductors or really, really, they're really, really dense metals. Um, so they might have some applications in, in construction or um, photovoltaics. So why don't they have yeah. like um, melting points or electronegativity? Because they they those elements don't last. The isotopes they've been they able to make right. don't last long right. enough to take a melting point or a yeah. density. Um, a lot of them there's a there's a cutoff to to be able to say that you made a new element. You have to to provide it, it has to be repeatable by somebody else with a different particle accelerator. Um, and it has to last longer than some arbitrary cutoff. It's probably, I think it's like half a second, or maybe it's a hundred milliseconds or something like that. It's a pretty short cutoff, but there's been evidence of other elements created that just break apart so fast you can barely measure them. Um, and so that's why there's sort of a like, okay, sure, that's cool, but it's not a new element unless it lasts at least this long. We're, we're gatekeeping the particle physicists. All right, let's take a break. We come back, we'll turn the lights on a little bit because I'm getting sleepy. Um, Holding my I like it. Yes. I want so this is being being So let's say whatever this year. What? Let's say that this is just like right now that I'm trying to make sure it's fine. I think this was old states. Yeah. 
Right. That would give you a plus six here going to a plus five. Now that's another reduction. Yep. So oh, it's 204. Yeah. It's called that word. I don't know if that's a real compound that exists, yeah. but it at least lets you go, go through that process. Okay. Good catch. Like, that's how it's made up, it's
Yeah, there's a little salad, a little like chow mein, rice, salad thing. Do you want? Uh, it's just in the, the classroom. It's not really a classroom, it's like a small place. Well, right by the middle there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's HSI. <laughs> It was when it was the proctoring center originally. So uh, you can see the classroom. Yeah. Um, and so they had it set up so that uh, with a bunch of um, uh, cameras and stuff to make sure that you were you know, not cheating and that kind of thing. Um, and this was the math tutoring center. So this is where all the tutors worked. Um, then it was then it was shared faculty office. For a while, and that was really weird because they you can see into their office um, with the windows. They didn't have the windows frosted, so they just like kept the blinds drawn the whole time because otherwise it's just kind of weird. Um, and now it's HSI. Now that all the faculty have our offices. I had one more question. Yeah, on that. Uh, so we were talking about yeah. that. Um, um, you would say um, mathematically, you don't really like, admit that, right? The weight is molarity per unit time. Mm -hmm. And this is just molarity, but except it's really concentrated. It's three, four values in concentration. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so it would be molarity to the force. How do we get there? Or like how? Like, so that's not right. That's not right. So it it should be um, molarity. So we can't call one value molarity. So it's molarity squared on the bottom. Molarity to the force, not in the molarity. Oh, sorry, in the third, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Because you get molarity divided by molarity to the fourth times seconds. Yeah. So you cancel that out and get a three, that goes away. So you just get one over molarity cubed seconds. Right. right. And oh. that's and that goes back to the that chemical potential I was talking about and not how I think this doesn't make any sense, but you put it in chemical. Potential. Yeah, this makes a little bit more sense. It's still a very different <laughs> trip, but um, but it, that, it's not useless like yeah. that is. Well, so I like did that. I like I like was like okay, I heard a student be in class, or whatever. but like that was pertaining to this like rate of one right? And I don't know, like wait, and that is not true. It's not mentioned consistent, right? Blah blah. blah. And then, um, that's why with both rate constants and equilibrium constants, usually it does you just kind of ignore them. Not actually, like this, like this. Yeah. They're dusty. So I might be wrong in certain aspects. Actually, these were like um, these are dusty. They're salt. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. So in this case, this is just for first order reaction. Right? No, <laughs> it, it seems like because it has that natural log term in it. Yeah, but. K for any reaction is equal to A to the E okay. minus activation energy over R. R so, yeah, no. so, well, it's, there's that. So, from the sun, I think he grabbed a lot so of it. Two different things. Well, it was like four different I cannot. Right. 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 So, 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 no, oh, you didn't pay. No, you did that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you didn't pay. 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 No, well, yeah, I mean, the integrated reaction or the simplified uh, domestic I've been switched. I'm doing this for you, I'm whole thing. I'm like, compared to you guys. <laughs> first order, it's first order. <laughs> first order. <laughs> 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 
you can't have a board in the year any of these. Because this is, if it's second order, it's yeah, the same okay. reactants and everywhere else is zero. Otherwise, you wind up with, when you try to integrate these, you get extra terms. You have partial differentials that you have to integrate, and it gets really nasty and weird. So these are, those integrated raw rate laws are not the whole thing where that's the same but the same size of the we're giving you right now. <laughs> and then, but my brain figures, it was a small pen, but I learned a lot of things because of it. Where they happen to be to make A work out because there are no units here left over, right? Yeah. Because this is joules per mole Kelvin, this is Kelvin, and this is joules per mole. We do that. Makes sense. Plus, we don't usually carry units over, but when we take an exponential or a log of something, we basically treat it like the units disappear. So it's, yeah. so it's unitless when it comes out of E. Yeah, yeah. And so A is just whatever it has to be to make the units on K work. Yeah, yeah. But and it, and really, that actually is where that chemical potential comes in because the A term has the randomness, has the like, what is the probability of these things run into each other the right way, yeah, yeah. linked into it, and that's when you get that inverse molarity winds up kind of making sense because you get a per mole per liter factor. Like okay, well, they can this many times per second, and if there's this many volts of them per liter, for every one mole per liter, it can divide this many times. So, in terms of collision rates, it doesn't work. Yeah, 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 I interrupted. You go ahead. So that's what, like, uh, it's, 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 it's a qualitative relationship between reaction rate and other variants. Um, you know what? As the, the uh, um, temperature increases, the collision rate increases. That I was talking about. And, and, and in the general, there's that, that term in the relative labs. That all labs. That term as well, because more yeah. of your molecules have enough energy to get over the barrier That's if you're at a higher temperature. Okay. So you get that ratio where as temperature goes up, a larger portion of them well, is to meet that barrier. Can we plug that into Desmos when you get that? When we get that? If you integrate it, you plug it into Desmos, you'll get the Boltzmann distribution. Oh, so we were discussing, so like uh, outside, like let's say like you have alpha particles or rays coming down and that's like nuclear. So if you were where it's being oxide, yeah. it's being oxide, then it's absorbing the energy instead of letting it come to your like yes. So it's, it's not what the radiation from the sun is not it's not radioactivity. It's that right of the most what we can observe is the earth. He's just he's setting himself up. The it's a really high energy light. So you get so you get UV light, which can be damaging to yourself. And some some of those by having transitions. Uh, um, so to uh, promote an electron, uh -huh. you can uh -huh. have it trickle uh -huh. down and just get to the speed. Mutations, that energy is all dissipated in heat, basically. So if your sunblock is taking it in as energy and dissipating it as heat. That's different form, like less dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. If you go, if you you get so there's another type of, of radiation that that we have to talk to Charles this class called uh, cosmic radiation. And that's basically that all the bits of the sun actually does throw out, but they're not alpha particles. They're their own particles. 
Um, and our we'll hear from Spec uh, uh, to have a little seal to make sure that some of the data they are and that's where we went to that little work that we saw the quality of the back. Okay, so let's go and see if I can talk. I'm just like, like, we should have got some. So, all right, all right, let's go and on the foot of the back. And let's talk about that binding energy. So, when we're talking about the valley of stability or island, I mean, islands of stability, um, that's all well and good. That's all really qualitative, though. It's all very conceptual. And I just kind of hand waved right past the numbers part of it, right? I just said, well, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it's stable, and sometimes it's not. How we quantify that is by looking at what's called the mass defect. So it turns out, not it turns out, it, um, if you've ever looked carefully at the um, at the periodic table, I think we talked about this. I mentioned some radioactive stuff to my high schoolers the other day, so maybe it was them. Um, we talk about how there's less energy or there's less mass than the sum of its parts. When we're talking about, say, something like fluorine, fluorine only has one isotope on Earth. It's fluorine 19. And so that should be nine times the mass of a proton, which is like 1.008, plus 10 times the mass of a neutron, which is 1.007, I think, uh, grams per mole. Well, we should be able to say, okay, well, if fluorine is made up of nine protons and 10 neutrons, the mass of a fluorine nucleus should be 19 point, I don't know, 0.07, 01, 01, 4 or so. Can you just add those numbers up? Somebody who's got a periodic table out, what's the mass of fluorine on the periodic table? <laughs> the difference in those two masses is what's called the mass defect. It's basically the mass that's missing. And that's, that is where the energy that holds the nucleus together comes from. Because Einstein's most famous equation equals mc squared. What this was actually showing is called the energy mass equivalence. You don't actually have the law of conservation of energy and the law of conservation of mass. You have the law of conservation of mass and energy. Mass is just another form of energy is what this equation is saying. So the reason that these two masses don't match up is because there has to be some extra energy basically stored in the nucleus holding it all together. And the difference in energy, or the difference in mass between these, is a how we can actually look at a nuclear reaction and predict how many kilojoules per mole it's going to give off. Because we can take this, we can look at this, Say, so, okay, well, if I know what the difference in the mass is, if I know what the mass defect is between these two numbers, I can calculate the nuclear binding energy. Of course, it's it's got to be in, we're dealing with this is a physics equation, right? So we can't just use grams because physics doesn't do anything in grams. But if you take, if you put it in kilograms, look at the units, both what units you get from e equals mc squared. You get kilograms times meters squared per second squared, which has its own name, right? Physics, what is that? That's a joule. That's a joule, exactly. It's a nice joule. This is your equation for kinetic energy, right? This is your original definition of a joule. Was mass times velocity squared? If you make that velocity the speed of light, 
and your mass, the mass defect, you still get joules out of this. And speed of light is really big number, right? Even if you know our mass defect is pretty small, what are we going to get for our number here? What's our mass defect? <laughs> Give me 19.014 minus 18.998. That's in grams, right? So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5 kilograms. Get that physical stuff out of here. So what do we get when we plug this in? And for those of you who don't have your equation sheet on you, speed of light, we're only going to two sig figs. We can just call it 3.0 times 10 to the eight meters per second. So we get something like, 4.8 times 10 to the 11. That's kind of a big number, right? Even if we put it in kilojoules. And this was, we did this, this was in grams per mole, right? So really this is in kilograms per mole. So we're going to get joules per mole out of this for tracking all of our units. Even in kilojoules, you get 4.8 times 10 to the 8 kilojoules per mole. <clears throat> How many kilojoules per mole are we looking at for something like combustion of, of uh, organics? Does anybody remember? Top of their head? Two. It's, it's usually like in the hundreds of kilojoules. And this is in the hundreds of millions of kilojoules. There's a lot of energy in nuclear reactions. But that's that's the energy that's keeping those protons stuck together, even though protons push apart other protons. Their protons push away other protons, but not with a nearly as much energy as we is holding them together. So the way we would usually use this, skip that slide for a second, is in terms of delta E equals delta M C squared. So similar to what we just did, but most of the time we're gonna look at it in terms of an actual reaction. Because knowing what the nuclear binding energy is, is cool, but it's not really useful because, well, there's a whole bunch of energy holding it together. We get, what do we do with that energy? Well, the way we can get some of that energy out is if we let a nuclear reaction happen. And if the reaction happens, all we have to do is add up all the masses before and after, just do a final minus initial, get the change in the mass defect. The change in the mass from product, products minus reactants, we can plug in as delta M, which means we can estimate the enthalpy of this reaction. It's not truly enthalpy because it's not being stored in chemical bonds. <laughs> We can estimate the change in energy, though, for this reaction by just looking at the pieces. So our products here versus here. <laughs> 235.86769 minus 236.05258. It's already nicely added up for you, but everybody can see how we just take the pieces of before and after, right? Just like we would with delta H and formation values. So let's, let's look at it for this reaction. So if delta M is that subtraction, we get 0.0, .0 
Somebody who's got a calculator. Again, would be borrowing in my head from the class. Mm -hmm. point two. But it's negative, isn't it? It is going to be negative. It's, it's technically 1.8, but. We'll call it minus 1.8. I mean, 0.18. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which means negative 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms per mole, right? Four kilograms. So if we want delta E, negative 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms per mole times 3.0 times 10 to the minus or 10 to the positive 8 meters per second squared. I did the math in my head wrong on the other one, just didn't read, squared the exponent, and I didn't square the coefficient on the speed of light. But it doesn't matter. We'll get it right here. This will be 9 times 10 to the 16 times 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4. It's negative five point four times ten to the four. Uh, oh, I don't know. But I don't know if that's more calculator. Oh wait, no, it's not. So we square. Oh, oh never mind. I didn't square. I didn't see that. One point six Where's times that? ten to the thirteen. And ten to fourteen. Thirteen. Thirteen. Or minus one point six times ten to the ten kilojoules per mole. So now we're in the tens of billions, sixteen billion kilojoules per mole. A lot of energy there. Um, I'm assuming being being a bunch of science nerds, most of you have seen Oppenheimer. I still have not, because when you have small kids sitting down to watch a three and a half hour Christopher Nolan biopic, it's just not always in the cards. Um, but I have heard that there, it mentions the letter that Einstein wrote, and a bunch of scientists, Einstein is the biggest name on it wrote to FDR encouraging him to put money into the Manhattan Project during World War II. This calculation <laughs> is what led him to do that. Because as soon as he proved energy mass equivalence and they realized that these nuclear reactions had this much energy per mole being the least, I mean, what's a mole of uranium? It's less than a kilogram, right? A mole of uranium is 230 grams. So in order to release 16 billion kilojoules, you only need under a kilogram, under a pound of material. And just crunching these numbers and realizing, hey, this is possible to make a bomb out of this is what encouraged all of the allied scientists to basically, they all collectively wrote a letter to FDR saying, hey, we know it's wartime and you know, science funding kind of goes out of the window during wartime usually because all the government's discretionary money goes to making you know, tanks and planes. Um, but they were able to convince him just how serious it was and how much of a game changer a nuclear weapon would be because of these calculations right here. Um, and look at that, it was. When you will 
probably won't get to it today, but we'll actually look at the engineering behind those two bombs that were that were dropped in Japan. Um, and they weren't even very efficient. They only had like one, I think, I think the first one was a simpler design. Their mortar was going to work. Um, and it only had something like 1.7% efficiency. And it was still enough to be, I think it was a 15 kiloton bomb, meaning 15,000 tons of TNT equivalent. And think about what that, like, I don't know if you can visualize what a ton of TNT looks like, but visualize just like a ton of anything, literal 2,000 pounds. That's like a, that's a trailer, right? A travel trailer. It's like a ton or so. Now picture that big of an object made entirely out of TNT. And that's one ton of TNT. The first nuclear bomb was 15,000 of those trailers. No wonder it was a game changer, right? Instead of firebombing the entire city with hundreds of planes dropping bombs day after day after day, they did it once and they wiped out two whole cities. Well, twice, but um, it's a, an absurd amount of energy compared to the numbers we've been dealing with. Even with otherwise really exothermic reactions, this is just on, it's literally on another level. The orders of magnitudes difference. Um, before we start going into some of the other calculation stuff um, and radio, radioactive dating, um, we're pointing out also just in terms of that valley of stability, this is another way of sort of visualizing that valley of stability. Nuclei are most stable when you can maximize that binding energy, that nuclear binding energy which tends to happen in between two really specific points. So we, we already said that, that lead is a stable nucleus, right? Nothing bigger than lead is stable. Um, that's lead right there. And right here is iron. Basically everything that is stable and actually, iron is the most lead is actually I'm sorry, it's all the way up, um, all the way up here. I was wrong about that. Everything that's stable is in this range. The most stable ones, though, happen are is uh, iron. The biggest nuclear binding energy um, winds up being um, with iron. So over a long enough time scale, talking like lifespan of the universe, eventually. They predicted that all nuclei will be iron nuclei because iron nuclei are the most stable. So if you give everything enough time, you shake your box enough times, eventually everything winds up reacting, right? And if it's always reacting in the same direction towards these most stable nuclei, that means that eventually you're going to get more and more of those iron nuclei, those most stable nuclei. Um, it's also part of the way that we know that our solar system is a second generation solar system is the fact that we have elements that are heavier than iron. First generation solar systems can only have elements um, up to, and really it's going to, they're mostly just going to be hydrogen and helium for the most part. The earliest solar systems were pretty much just hydrogen and helium. But anything that exists in our solar system that's heavier in grams per mole than iron had to come from a supernova from a pre-existing star. So if you've ever heard that, you know, inspirational quote, we're all stardust, that's what it's referring to. The fact that all of the elements in our body that are really all the ones that are heavier than helium or lithium came from a supernova of another star. Um, and then just collected into a big cloud that turned into the planets in the in our sun. Kind of cool uh, to think about. Big picture stuff. Um, <clears throat> one more point I'll make about these, these numbers. Uh, that much energy that we say the 1.8 times 10 to the 13 or joules per mole. 
when you're releasing all of that energy at once, this is why they, it usually says plus gamma rays in pretty much all nuclear processes. If you're trying to dump all of this energy out all at once, there's, there's literally not enough time for it to just go in terms of increasing heat. You can't disperse the energy fast enough for it to go through normal vibe because heat is basically just molecules vibrating, right? So normally an exothermic reaction just warms stuff up, makes the molecules vibrate faster. This makes them vibrate so fast that they generate photons that are not even just in the visible range that are in the uh, UV gamma ray X-ray range in terms of energy. Um, and so this is why those type of uh, reactions also have usually have other types of radiation that accompany. It's not just that you make neutrons um, or alpha particles or beta particles, you always get a plus energy factor in there too. And that plus energy is what winds up being usually grouped into the gamma ray range. All right, we'll start with this one. This is a fusion reaction, but it does the exact same thing. So a fusion reaction still has that nuclear binding energy before and after. So we can still predict how much energy per mole is gonna be given off. And I think we're gonna skip that one. We're gonna start next lecture with that one because I wanna get into talking about um, the rates like, like we were working on for our lab today or yesterday. Um, when we're talking about nuclear reactions, one of the points that I wanted that lab to get across is the fact that all of, all of those dice, all of those pennies, they all had their individual probability of reacting, right? It didn't matter what this die over here did, this die is going to land how it's going to land, right? They're all independent probabilities. We can sum all of them up as a system, but every, every die had its own probability, all the likelihood of coming up six. That's sort of the definition of a first order reaction. A first order reaction, kind of by definition, means. <laughs> that you've got some probability that the reaction is going to happen and it's not dependent on anything else around it. So nuclear reactions are all naturally occurring nuclear reactions. Let me change that. Um, are all first order reactions. So that's why that's why we somebody asked, them, sorry, the other class. Um, when we talk about half-lives being a constant with radioactive materials, it's because they're first-order reactions. If they were second-order reactions, then you wouldn't have a constant half-life the way that we hear them described. Like, you hear things all the time. The half-life of uranium is 4.5 billion years. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,000 years. The reason we can say that is because they're all first-order processes. And it doesn't matter how much material you have, it doesn't, the individual nuclei are not influencing the nuclei around them. They all have their own individual probability of reacting. Maybe it's a, there's a 1% chance per year for a certain isotope, but it doesn't matter. That nuclei doesn't affect anything else around it. Um, second order reactions in general mean things need to bump into each other to happen. And zero order reactions, that's kind of a hard one to explain without getting into. There really aren't that many true zero order reactions. Um, most chemical reactions are going to be first order or second order until you start getting into biochem and things like that, where you have more complicated systems happening. In general, everything's going to be first order or second order in terms of natural processes or abiotic processes anyway. So that means that we basically just need to worry about this equation when it comes to nuclear reactions, right? And so that means that the way that, that we can ask questions about that can vary a little bit as you saw on the, on the lab, right? Here's the half-life for a material. 
put it in terms of how really what would make more sense, frankly, is if they just gave us the K value. But people don't think in terms of rate constants. People, you in general, think in terms of time pretty well. The idea of half life and having a fixed amount of time, that kind of makes sense. You can wrap your head around what that means. If I just say the rate constant is this, okay, great. I still can't visualize what that means though, right? So it's really just, we use half-lives to communicate about radioactive isotopes, mostly because it's easiest, easier to think about what's happening. But if we want to then turn around and do any calculations with it, we have to, uh, turn around and find K. So in this case, half life for carbon 14 is 5,730 years. What's the rate constant for the breakdown of carbon 14? So we start by just figuring out negative um, 1.2 times 10 to the negative fourth. Four. Once we have that, we can figure out anything else, right? So, for instance, if we started with 0 0.110 grams of carbon-14, how much is going to be left over after 11,000 years? Well, we plug in 1 point, or 0 0.110 grams here, plug in our K, plug in our T, Solve for our final our final amount, right? So we'll get not right. Didn't leave myself. <laughs> so it should be something between half and a quarter of what we started with, right? 11,000 years is a little bit less than, no, or is it right on the money? No, it's just under two half lives, right? So we should get something pretty close to a quarter of what we started with. Pretty close to a quarter, right? So this first order kinetics in measuring half-lives and rate constants is what all of radiometric dating is based on. If you know there are some naturally occurring processes that produce radioisotopes that have known rate constants, you can figure out how long those isotopes have been there. You still have to get a little bit creative with how you can define that and adding enough more sig figs and things like that. But the general gist of it is, I know I started with this much carbon-14. I currently have this much carbon-14. How much time has passed? A lot of people still looking at calculators. We feeling okay about about this? 
Any questions on it? Algebra that involves logs, so it takes a little bit of practice. Let's talk about carbon dating specifically. So one of the key aspects that I say is, well, if you've got a known amount of your radioisotope to begin with, and you know how much you still have, that relies on knowing how much you started, right? In order for that to work. So a big chunk of radiometric dating is figuring out how can we estimate a good starting value? How do we know how much of a specific radioisotope did you start with? And that's where, if we're talking about minerals, that's where geology comes in to be able to tell that um, from the crystal structure of an asteroid from a meteorite, we can tell that it, it was formed all as one homogeneous mixture that was all uranium, for instance. Um, in this case, this is actually common, carbon dating is sort of a combination of um, chemists and physicists and biologists all sort of working together. The physicists and the astronomers figured out that carbon-14 is made, is produced up in the upper atmosphere as a result of some of that cosmic radiation, some of the solar radiation in the upper atmosphere. Um, and it's produced more or less at a constant amount. Basically what happens is, is you wind up with nitrogen being bombarded by really high energy light and other, other uh, neutrons, other charged particles in the upper atmosphere and converting into carbon-14. And that happens more or less constantly. Um, the amount of nitrogen in the upper atmosphere is a constant. And the, and the output of the sun with some you know year-to-year -year fluctuations is relatively constant as well. So we actually can say, okay, well, we know carbon-14 is produced at pretty constant levels in the upper atmosphere over you know, 50,000 years, the past 50,000 years, past 100,000 years. When the sun was noticeably significantly younger, meaning like a billion years ago, then you might have a different amount of carbon-14 produced in the upper atmosphere when the sun was younger because it was giving off different types of radiation. We also can estimate that too. Um, if we get into the astronomy and life cycle star and things like that. Um, so this means that the amount of CO2 that has carbon-14 in it is pretty much a constant as well. And since CO2 is the only source of carbon really for plants, plants get all of their carbon by taking CO2 and reducing the carbon to make sugar, right? So all of photosynthesis, which means are all of photosynthetic organisms are going to be constantly taking in small amounts of carbon-14 while they're photosynthesizing. What happens when a plant stops photosynthesizing? Dies. It dies, um, which could mean a lot of things. It could mean that that, a, um, that, that plant material was then turned into a textile it could mean that that plant material was eaten, but either way, when the plant dies, you stop incorporating new carbon-14 into the plant and the decay process starts. If you're not incorporating new carbon-14 into the plant, that's our starting value, that's our A0, is how much carbon-14 do living organisms have in them when they're living. And then when they stop living, they stop incorporating more CO2 in. At which point, we can say that that clock starts on the radiometric dating. So T naught is when the plant died that the material was um, got its carbon from. So if we know the half life of carbon fourteen, and we know that it started with a certain ratio of carbon fourteen to carbon twelve which is a, year, a weird concentration unit, but it's a concentration unit. And then we can measure the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio. We can figure out how much time has passed. So these are real numbers for the Shroud of Turin, which if you didn't grow up in the 90s, it was a big deal in the 90s. There was a Vatican artifact 
um, that was supposedly um, Jesus Christ's death shroud that he was buried in because there was a stain on it that looked a little bit like a face. And they claimed that since the Middle Ages, they had this piece of cloth that they said was Jesus Christ's burial shroud. Um, when carbon dating became widely available, they were able to do this test and actually, well, let's figure out how old that textile is. When, when did that plant stop living? And does it match with, with the, does it provide providence? saying that, yes, maybe it's plausible that this could happen, and it's a Mythbusters episode, basically. Is this even possible based on this the radioactivity? So let's do the math. I feel like it, was, it must have been in the 90s that they actually run this, ran this test. I feel like references to the Shroud of Turin were everywhere for a while when I was growing up. 60 minutes. Yeah. I remember, like, the documentaries and stuff. So we just figured out K for this one a few slides ago, right? What was K for? 1.2 times 10 to the negative 4. What are we going to plug for? Plug in for A naught and A. A naught is a 1. So then the question is just what is T? So ln of 1.00 10 to the minus 12. I'm sorry, I switched those. We do that, we're gonna get a, a date in a negative time, which isn't gonna make a whole lot of sense, right? 9.19 times 10 to the minus three, 13, over 1.00 times 10 to the minus 12. Equals minus 1.2, 10 to the minus four, time. Time. I think that's up three point nine one. That sounds more reasonable <laughs> because we shouldn't be getting a number a times ten to the minus in there. There you go. That would be the trick. So given that this test was run in the 1990s, they were able to pretty conclusively show mathematically that this artifact had to have been from the Middle Ages, had to have been from the 1200s or so, which also coincides historically with what was happening at the time. The Crusades, this was right around the time of the Crusades. So you had a bunch of, of medieval um, Europeans going to the Middle East, plundering cities, taking back artifacts, to store in in you know the Pope's treasure chambers in Vatican City, um, and so along the way there was all of these like, well, this is the finger bone of Saint Basil, and or this is you know this is the the nail that that pierced the side of Christ or something like that, and it was they didn't really have any way; they just took people at their word because why wouldn't you? These are the Crusaders; they're going off to be good Christian warriors, and 
we won't get into what they did while they were in Jerusalem and things like that, but um, they didn't until you know the late 1900s, they didn't have a way to test a lot of those claims. Um, but this was, like I said, culturally, this was a really big deal because for a really long time, all of those claims were basically taken at their word with no way of testing them. And this kind of, in a lot of ways, this sort of started the anti-scientific movement that kind of switched from religion in, or from like artifacts to um, climate change and young earth creationism. A lot of sort of the same rhetoric was used in the 90s. Say, well, the test must be flawed. How can you know this is going on? And you know, trying to trick scientists to prove that there was there was holes in their theory, um, and a lot of that started in the '90s as a direct result of this, which is really interesting from a historical point of view. It's definitely going to be one of those things that, in 100 years from now, um, like textbooks will probably still like when when students ask, "Why the heck were they still burning fossil fuels in in year 2000?" We can point to like, well. Here's some some things that were happening culturally. All right, we're over. Um, we're going to talk about engineering side of things and do some more practice with these <laughs> and nuclear reactors and stuff like that so on Tuesday. And you can get into some biology and some real stuff. So.